thanks for the introduction, Rich. Um, and howdy, y'all. As you heard, I'm from Oklahoma State. Um, that's how we say hello. Do you all know the plural of y'all? Anybody? Well, no, in some cases, maybe, but it's all y'all. So it's great to see all y'all here at the conference today. And uh, I have 30 minutes, and I really probably won't go much over that because a guy my age, that's about my you know, bathroom cycle. I got to go about it. So anyway, no worries about that. Um, but on a little bit more serious note, I want to talk about classroom culture and why it matters. And um, one of the things I want to emphasize is I'm not up here at all to suggest you need to do what I do. You don't. I'm going to share what I do. In fact, if we all had a chance to talk more about it, I could probably learn a great deal from you all about what you do in your classrooms and why it's so important. But I hope that as I talk about what I do and what I've learned, that it helps and maybe inspires some of you. So let me give you a little bit of background uh, where I come from. Uh, Rich did read the intro about me, but I'm really an industry guy. I didn't set foot in the classroom till 2007. And I never imagined even a few years after that, if someone had come up to me and said, Jerry, you're going to be a full-time college professor. You're going to have co-authored some textbooks. I would have been like, you are out of your mind. You don't know what you're talking about. Um, but now that's where I am, and I love it, but it's not where I came from. I come out of industry, but since 2007, I've seen a lot of kids go through my classroom, as you can see on the screen. Uh, I've taught several courses, lots of sections, so I've learned a few things, and some of those things I hope to share with you today. So here are my objectives, is just to talk about the classroom um, and what we are all kind of experiencing, and if you're like me, you've seen a lot of changes just in the last two years. Define what I mean by classroom culture, and emphasize just really how important it is and sometimes I think we, it gets lost, at least on me, periodically. I get reminded uh, through things that happen about the culture that I have. And I've, over the years, become a lot more intentional about my culture that I, I build and maintain in the classroom. So, and just some ideas. That's what I want to do. So let's just talk about my classroom population, and let's see how it maybe compares to yours. So... I now have two to three times the number of students that need accommodations from just a few years ago. I can remember when in a typical semester I would get two, maybe three letters of accommodation from our student accessibility services office. It's like, okay, fine. And we'd meet with the student and extend test times or other things that were necessary to help them. Now it's 12 to 15 to 18 letters a semester. Something has changed. So I get a lot of those, um, lots of anxiety, and way more than certainly I ever had as an undergraduate, but way more than just a few years ago. And, and maybe COVID is to blame, and all the things that happened there, but maybe it isn't just COVID. So see a lot more of anxiety. And the thing that bothers me the most is that they don't talk about it, not to me. Not enough of them do. Another thing is lots of first-generation students, which is great. And the, the problem is that sometimes I don't know that. And I think oftentimes I'll certainly make assumptions about, well, you should know what you need to do to succeed in college. And no, they don't always know those things. So we're seeing a lot more, at least I am, and in our school we are. Uh, lots of international students. And they have a, a, a really different orientation in many cases about how they should interact with a professor than our students that are here from the U.S. And even personalities. Uh, I read a book a few years ago that was really influential. I'm an introvert, and some of my friends who hear me say that go, no, you're not. And I said, no, I really am. I'm right on the border between introvert and extrovert, but I'm truly an introvert. Too much people time, and I need to retreat. And there's a book called Quiet by Susan Cain. Has anybody read that? Yeah? Good? You, yeah, amazing book. I would recommend every person who teaches read that book because statistically a third to 40% of our students are introverts. 
And they're the quiet ones that sit there, soak it all up, never say a word. And who gets our attention in the classroom? The extroverts that are always like, oh, oh, pick me, let me answer, right? <laughs> Those, and we value them, right, because they're participating. But anyway, a good book. And so we have to figure out, you know, how do we provide a great experience to both kinds? And it's just differing expectations, right? We've had the students who are the honor students, and they will die if they get anything less than an A. And they are, I, no kidding, I, I have one of these students. Her name is Evie, and she's wonderful. And I saw her sitting outside my office one day, and I said, hey, Evie, what are you working on? And it was actually, she was working on a project for Kenda Wilson's design class. And she showed it to me, and she goes, this just very matter-of-factly, yeah, I'm eight weeks ahead. I was like, of course you are. So we have some of those students. <laughs> Not many, but we have some of those students. Then we also have the C's get degrees crowd too, right? These are the students that are in our classrooms. Lots of different motivations. And so it's kind of like the bell curve, right? They, we have the, the Evies on one end of the curve, and then we have the C's get degrees on the other end, and, and how do we engage them all? Because we want to, right? None of us are satisfied with just engaging the 15% on the you know, high motivation side of this curve. Well, how we do that is through culture. So Adam Grant, another great author, he wrote Originals, which is one I read um, and recommend as well. This is a definition that he gives of culture. Of course, this is kind of a corporate definition, and it's a good one but I've modified it. So I paraphrase this for us, and here's the way I would say it. The culture of a classroom, a professor's values, norms, and practices has a huge impact on student happiness and success. So with apologies to Adam Grant, that is how I would define culture. And what does it look like? Well, it's all the things we do. It's these things. It's the norms, the expectations, it's the social realities, the little traditions and habits that we have that characterize how we conduct business in the classroom. And Seth Godin put it this way, people like us doing things like this. That's what our culture is. And so you're going to hear me talk a little bit more in a minute about how we all have a culture that is specific and unique. Uh, and maybe, in my case certainly, I haven't always paid really close attention to it until fairly recently. So let's talk about why it matters so much. It matters because a good, healthy classroom culture helps break down the us versus them barrier. And, and I think we might be surprised if we could truly know how many students, maybe this is a little bit overstated, but look at us as the enemy. You stand in the way of me getting a grade I need to get through this class and move on. And you're going to make it hard for me. And there's some students who feel that way. And we need to break down those barriers to the extent that we can. Um, it is the key to building trust, which, of course, without trust, there can be no relationship. Uh, and that's what, we, that's what I want, anyway. I value the relationships that I have with students. The reason why I'm not counting down the number of days till retirement is because I like what I do. And I like what I do because I get to have relationships with many students. And I get to pour into their lives in, a, in certain ways. And, and that to me is very, very gratifying. My, my wife, when I come home, one of the first questions she usually asks me is, well, who came to see you today? And she doesn't know any of these students, by, meaning she's met very few of them. She's met some of them. But she's heard me say names, and so I'll start running down the list. And one day, I, I was giving her the list, and she was like, okay, you, you need to have your door closed some so you could get work done. And I said, okay, true, true story. I actually did on a Friday. I really need to get something done. I closed my door, and I turned off the light. Because that's the trick, is they come and see, oh, the light's on. They can see through the transom window. He's in there. Knocked on a door. I don't do that very often because I usually like the interruptions, but once in a while. Um, the other thing a great culture does, the reason it matters so much, is it creates a desire for them to want to be present and to learn. Um, it's also the foundation for the experience. So I teach 
services marketing and my co-author is standing in the back of the room for our services marketing, services and experience marketing text. And I'm very much about the experience being the main thing that most businesses have to offer that differentiates them. It's also true, it's what differentiates us. The experience that we provide in the classroom. So I want to talk about this guy because I just learned about him. Gilbert Strang, uh, mathematics professor, 51 years, 61 years. I need to get my eyes checked. 61 years at MIT. Uh, but I love some of the things that I read he said in the article that popped up just about a month ago. Um, he's very open with his materials and was one of the first to share them on the MIT OpenCourseWare system. But look at some of the things he said. Not everyone learns the same way. Yeah. It's important to make learning human. And we're talking about mathematics, right? And he's, he understands the importance of humanizing that. And you're a person like the student is a person. And these aren't just words because he just retired on May 15th, taught his last class ever. And his students gave him a standing ovation. That probably meant more to him than anything else he could have received for all the years of service that he put in. So he's kind of a role model, I think, for all of us in terms of how to have a classroom culture. So I want to talk about what my classroom culture is like. And again, I'm not trying to suggest to any of you, do it like I do. No, do it like you do. But this is what I do and what comes out of it for me. So the first thing I do is, and I love Kate Eaton's presentation yesterday because she does the same thing. I get there early because, as she said, rapport building happens in the cracks. I think it was the, the way she phrased it. And, and I come out of the business world, so we used to call them water cooler chats. You know, you're hanging around the break room and just spontaneous conversations take place. Well, that's what happens when you show up early. It's what happens for me. And I get to talk to students and get to know them better. So I, I show up early very deliberately for that reason. Um, the other thing I do, and uh, I finish on time or early. And I'm not saying that if you don't do this, you're wrong. Not at all. It's just what I do. It's what I do, and the students appreciate that. And uh, it, I think it shows that you know, they feel like I respect their time. So I, I finish early or on time. And what about food or drink in class? Sure, it's fine. And often I will mooch off some of my students if they have something good. <laughs> and the other thing that I've done is I've encouraged them, especially in my services marketing class, hey, you want to order food, pizza, and have it delivered to class? Go right ahead, please. And then I qualify. Now, I'm not going to pay for it, but you're welcome to do that. And I've had students do that, and it was great because, number one, we had fun with it. And number two, because it was a services marketing class, the delivery guy, I said, okay, hang on before you leave. And I interviewed him. And we talked about the difference he makes in providing his service. And so just things like that. That's just what I do. Um, something else that I do, anybody play Wordle? Yeah, we play Wordle in class. And this is something that we usually do right before class starts. And the students like it because they figure out this is, this is a Jerry thing. And I get so many comments about it. But we play Wordle. I actually have a student who, um, he's taken two classes from me, and he stays awake until 12.01 to play the next day's Wordle. And it was all he could do to not give too many hints on what to, the answer was for the day's Wordle. And it got to be kind of a running joke. But see, those are the good things that can take place. So we pl always play Wordle. If there's enough time, we go on to play Hurdle, if you've ever done that, and even Framed. We, we, we have a series one time. We even, I had a young lady talk me into um, the online version of Family Feud, and we did that in class. These are all things that happen right before class starts or maybe a minute or two after class starts. But Wordle's kind of a, a deal for us. And then I don't honestly even know how this got started, but many years ago, I just decided, you know what, we're going to do trivia to start every class. Now, my strategy was it generates engagement. Maybe not engagement about the topic, but it stimulates a lot of engagement. So here we go. This is actual June 16th. It is June 16th, right? This is on this day in history, June 16th. 1903, this auto company 
was incorporated. Which one do you think it is? Ford. Ford, that's right. And I am the proud owner of a Ford product. The next one, in 1911, the computing, tabulating, recording company was founded in Endicott, New York. Still exists today under a different name. IBM, my very first employer, my first 10 years in industry was with IBM. And then here's another one. 2016, this firm opened its first mainland China theme park in Shanghai. Disney, right. These were pretty easy. We also do birthdays, what celebrity birthdays there are, if there are some notable ones. And I always ask the class, anybody in here have a birthday? I think most of the time they don't want to admit it, but occasionally someone says, yeah, it's my birthday today. And I, yes, I have actually sung happy birthday to a student. And another time, another student in a, in a previous class say, hey, your next class, Katie has a birthday, and she won't tell you, but I wanted you to know. So, you know, those kind of things happen, and, and they're fun. Um, so that's what we do at the start. So what is with all the fun and games? And it really it is to start engagement and participation about something that doesn't really matter much. But once you get it going, it kind of has momentum on its own. And this is just kind of a feature of my classes. So in terms of instruction, you know, so this is a picture from March of this year. Uh, I don't know who outed me, but my birthday was on March 23rd, and I happened to be in class that day. And so the Grinch visited my class. Uh, turns out this was um, a former student and former TA. And I, it took me a while to figure that out, but it surprised me. And yes, everyone's saying happy birthday. And yes, I am 62 years old now. So we celebrated my birthday. But in terms of the instruction piece, the students always know what we're going to talk about. Because I make it very clear, we use Canvas at OSU. And I have a syllabus, and so I make sure, and I send out weekly announcements. So the information's there for them to always know this is what will happen in class today. And I stick to that pretty religiously. Um, the, one of the ways I do interaction, we probably all do the same thing, is I ask lots of questions, and I'm very comfortable with silence. So I'll ask a question, and I'll just... And you can look around the room, and you can see, you know, start to squirm a little bit. And finally, someone will like, OK, we've got to get this over with. And so then they'll answer. And that like breaks the log jam. And then, then we'll have participation after that. So I do that. That's just one technique. I'm sure many of us do that. The other thing, again, this, none of these are big deals. But kind of collectively, they all sort of create the culture that I have. I just have my students call me Jerry. Now, I might change that because about two weeks ago, I got a letter from our provost saying, congratulations, I wanted you to know Dr. Rackley, you'll be recommended for reappointment. And I was like, oh, I guess I have a PhD now. <laughs> it's like a battlefield promotion. So I, I, like, I, I think a letter from the provost addressing me as doctor is as good as a diploma in my book anyway. But no, I, I go by Jerry, and it really kind of goes back to the start of my career when I was a brand new hire at IBM, and I was walking around a branch office uh, like my first week there, and I ran into the branch manager who was head of the place and kind of intimidating, and I said, hello, Mr. Butler. And he said, Jerry, he said, everybody at IBM is on a first name basis. We are all professionals. And I was like, okay, Bob. And he said, Jerry, if the CEO walked in the branch office right now, he would expect you to call him John. And from that point on, I've just always kind of gone with that. So my students call me that. Sometimes they call me other things but, uh, <laughs> behind my back, but they call me Jerry as we converse. Um, I thought I was the king of dad jokes until Ryan warmed us up this morning. <laughs> and so I, I yield my crown to him. But I. I ply heavily in the trade of dad jokes in my classroom because that's who I am. So lots of humor in my classroom. Uh, spontaneity. So you see this picture. This is Carly. She just graduated in May. She took three classes from me. And I noticed over the three semesters she was in class with me, she loved to wear this bright yellow, fluorescent yellow. And so I teased her about it and asked her about it. She goes, no, it's truly my favorite color. So we just kind of spontaneously decided, you know what, we're having fluorescent yellow day on Tuesday if you want to participate. So here we are, Carly and myself, and why not, right? 
And uh, we did have some other students who participated in that as well. But seriously, you know, despite the fun, there are some pretty hard or sharp edges to what I do. And so if you were to read my syllabus, and I emphasize this with my students, no, I don't accept late assignments. And I sometimes have students say, why? And I said, because you're going to go out into industry, into the workforce, where most of the time they don't accept late assignments either. So why not figure that out right now? And I also don't round grades, because I keep telling them, you think I give you a grade. No, you earn it. And if you want to earn a A, you need to earn enough points to get there. That's on you, not on me. My battery is running low. <laughs> you know, that's, that's not just literally. It's after the 16-hour days bus time on Jackson, it was running low then, too. Um, so, but my students know this. They know this about me. And so while, yeah, we have fun, we have a a certain culture, they also know what the rules are. I make sure they know that. Here's something that um, I think is really important to know. Culture extends outside the classroom. It isn't just something that we flip on when we walk in, and when we're done, we flip it off. We, I, I say this, I, I've learned I need to be available, accessible, and approachable. And one of the reasons why is students are afraid of me. And we can go, well, of course, we understand freshmen, they're kind of intimidated by professors. But it isn't just the freshmen. And I know this because my TAs will come to me and tell me about all the emails and communications they've received. And I'm like, why are they not sending these to me? And I, well, because they're afraid of you. <laughs> afraid of me? But they are. And so I've learned I have to do everything I can to be these three things. So this is a picture from the last semester and one of the things I do is I try as often as possible, keep my door open and be very inviting. I happen to be in a place where a lot of students go by. And so what they now do is they see me in there and they come in and they sit down. I, you can't really see it, but um, I think I have a pointer, laser pointer somewhere. Anyway, on that bookshelf, the second shelf down is the snack shelf. And the popular item is trail mix. And the students all know, hey, I'm hungry, Jerry has trail mix, and they go in. And yes, I go buy the big bags of trail mix at Costco, because I go through it pretty fast. But I think what's interesting is these four students here, only one of the four was a student in my class the semester I took this picture. <laughs> but, but this is a very meaningful picture to me, because this says these students, they, they feel comfortable coming and just sitting down and visiting. And if you'll notice, there was no place for me to sit. My chair was occupied. <laughs> but I knew they wouldn't stay very long. But I, I think it's important for us to remember that there's a lot of students who are intimidated by us. And so I try to do everything I can to just lower that barrier as well. So an aspect of culture is you've got to recognize that you have one and know what it is. And I realized as I was preparing this presentation that I didn't really know what my students thought my culture was. So I actually reached out to about 15 of them who had just had me in class. And I said, hey, give me three words that describes my classroom culture. And so I made a word cloud. The thing that I was most encouraged about was that every single one of them had the same word, which was engaging. And that actually gives me something to aspire to keep that up. They had some other things they said, too, which you can see on the screen. But if you don't know what your culture is or you aren't sure, then do what I did. Go ask. What do they think it is? So another aspect of classroom culture is just clarity of purpose. Why are you there? And there are different motivations. I, I think there are certain faculty, and this is no criticism, they have research obligation. I don't because I'm clinical. And they know they have to teach class. It's an obligation. So they go check those two boxes off, and then they get back to the work that's more important to them. And then there are some who, that's their first, we have two new faculty members this fall. They've got to figure out how they're going to conduct business in the classroom. And then we have folks that are more my age. They're like, how many semesters till retirement? But why are you there? Why are your students there? Some of them are in your class. They don't know what they're going to do with their lives or if they're even in the right major, and some of them have got it all figured out. And in even what purpose does the course they're in that you're teaching serve? How does it help them? How is it equipping them? 
you know, clarity of purpose is really important as a cultural aspect. Something else is transparency. So in 2014, my dad died in September. And the week he died, I went to class and taught class. And my whole demeanor was, the students do not need to know. And so I soldiered through and taught class, although it was a little bit difficult for me. It's different for me now. I've learned the, the other way. I tell my students who I am and why. I tell them, you need to know something about me, not because I'm important, but because I'm going to spend the whole semester trying to influence how you think, and you deserve to know something about the person who's trying to influence you. So I'm very transparent up front, but also during the course of the semester. So that's my family. You can see we're a dog family. There's actually five in the picture. One of them's kind of hard to see. So they know a lot about me and how my wife and I met on a blind date while we were students at OSU. But even more recently, um, I was very transparent in May of last year. My mom died and my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer all in the same week. <laughs> so it's kind of a tough month. And so in the fall, um, you know, I talked to my students about, hey, this is the experience that we're having as a family. I was very touched by the response that I got from that. But, you know, my students need to know that, you know, Jerry might have some off days and, and, and have some understanding of why. Maybe I do. Um, what about expertise? You know, it certainly is a dimension or a component of the classroom culture. And, and I think sometimes we as professors think this is the value that we bring. Well, it is a value that we bring. Yes, it is important. But guess what? The students assume you're an expert. Right? When they walk into class, they, their assumption is you wouldn't be teaching if you didn't know something about this. So they assume that. What they really often do is they'll major in a professor. Have you ever had a student come up to you, to you and say, hey, what other classes do you teach? Right? It's not that they care about what those classes are. They just want to be in another class with you for lots of good reasons, potentially. Right? They're opting for quality. And so because I don't know everything, I bring a lot of outside experts in, which gives them a break from hearing Jerry all the time, but brings in a great industry perspective too. But um, quality is a key ingredient of culture. Uh, engagement is kind of the holy grail for us, and I would say don't limit it to just topical engagement. Any form of engagement is good. You know, we we have funny discussions about. Does pineapple belong on pizza? I feel very strongly that it does, and I've been shocked at how controversial that is. But yeah, we actually spend some time talking about that. Uh, but any kind of engagement, even if it's not about class or topical, will spawn more engagement about things that matter more. So, and don't overlook the emotional piece, right? We're marketers, we understand that loyalty is an emotion. And we want that emotional connection of our students to their major, to their class, to your class. Right? That's what we are trying to build. Um, let me introduce you to Trenton Cox. If I can. Along with the newfound fame, including making it on ESPN. That's a thousand dollar shot. Trenton got five hundred dollars and Visa gift cards and four hundred dollars and Fuzzy's Taco gift cards. Trenton found out how many friends he had after that. Um, Trenton, Trenton took three classes from me. He just graduated in May, but yeah, he made the half-court shot and got the money. Uh, and he, the day after that happened, the class day after that happened, um, he was late to class, but he walked in and we all just erupted in applause for him. We find all kinds of things to celebrate as part of the culture in our class. So let me wrap up because I know we're running out of time. So what about your classroom culture? Here's three things I want to share. Understand what it is and look for the gaps, right? You, you know what you think it is. See what the students are telling you it is, and they'll be honest with you. And then find out where are the gaps and what do I do about it. Um, evolve your culture. I am constantly evolving mine. I, I do not have it all figured out, and I don't have the recipe for success or the magic formula. I just am always evolving my classroom culture. And then articulate it often in as many ways as you can. Put it in the syllabus. Talk about it during a course overview on syllabus day. Reinforce it in one-on-one -on -one conversations with your students. This is what I'm about. This is what we're about. Reinforce it often. So I believe that if we first can capture their hearts, which we can do with a really good culture, we then are going to open up their minds so they will want to learn from us. So 
Here's some validation. I'm just going to put these up on the screen. I live for this. This is what makes me want to teach and not retire anytime soon. Is when I, now, do I get some of the other emails too? Okay, yes. <laughs> I get some of the other ones. Why won't you give me five more points so I can get a C instead of a D? And like, yeah, I get a few of those too, but um, these are the ones that I think we all really value and tell us something must be working, right? So I think that's all I have. I want to thank you for listening to what I had to say.